By the time I was 15 years old, I was considered one of the best players in the country. Oh yeah, I mean, he was like a rock star at 13 years old. When I first saw him, it, it, it was something I'd never seen. The term man-child was devised in order to describe Shea Tyler. High lob for Shea. Oh, 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 oh. oh my goodness. Growing up, Shea Cotton was the ultimate ball player at our age bracket. Uh, when I first saw him, I was like, there's no way that this dude is the same age as everybody else. <laughs> we were all trying to be as big as Shea Cotton. And if you were to assemble a dream team, a dream team of the best 14 and under players in the country, perhaps at the top of the list would be a kid by the name of Shea Cotton. It was unfair. You know, I felt like, oh, that ain't fair. This ain't fair. Shea Cotton is the best high school athlete that I've ever, ever seen. Porter has been all monarch so far. High love. Man, he was selling out gyms since sixth grade, seventh grade. Shea Cotton was like LeBron James before there ever was a LeBron James. If you don't do nothing wrong, and you don't take no money, and you don't cheat on no tests, you're at the top, and you're on your way, in one, in one day, it's taken from you. Just as much as they'll build you up, it's twice as easy for them to tear you down. It was, it was so much shit. It was like, damn, why do y'all pile all this on a kid? Like? It wasn't meant to be. He just had a talent, and he can teach kids what to do and what not to do. Shea's story is important to be told because he falls into that basketball Bible where it's not just here. To have people still calling you by your first and last name 20 years later, that means something. Google Shea Cotton and you'll see. Roger the light, standing tall. Haters want to see him fall. He's a man child. Man child. He's a man child. Good morning, everybody. Well, I want to thank um, TEDx UCSD on, on behalf of this opportunity. It's very gracious to be here. Um, thank you for waking up so nice and early. Everybody's uh, attentive. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, grew up in the LA Harbor area and uh, San Pedro, to be exact, by way of Long Beach. And I started out in baseball at 10, 11 years old, got bored with the sport. I was pretty good. I could field, I could hit. Um, wasn't getting a lot of action in the outfield at 11, so I grew bored with it and picked up the basketball. Played on the playground from an early age against the older, bigger guys. Got rid of the uh, physicality of the game early and uh, really dove into it. By the time I was 12, I was nationally known through ESPN, Scholastic Sports America, Sunkiss Kids. These are the biggest uh, things in the, in, in the sports realm at that time. ESPN is the worldwide leader in sports. This is before the social media generation, so this was huge at that time. And things really uh, catapulted for me pretty, pretty quickly. Um, I, w I would train and hone my skills with my older brother, who's two and a half years older, and he would constantly help me evolve and push the limits. He was bigger and stronger, so he would beat up on me, and that didn't feel too good early on. And eventually, you know, we, we would start to even out our battles, and I knew I was on the right track because he was very good in his own right. Moving forward, my childhood was, was, was a bit challenging growing up in the L.A. Harbor area. I dealt with a lot of the components that a lot of the kids in the inner city today deal with, you know, whether it be the drugs, the gangs, you know, the peer pressures of, uh, you know, leeches, the people, parasites, the women, all those things were there. And the thing that kept me grounded was my parents and having a strong support group and recognizing what I wanted to do in my life early on. Uh, there was no grades. There was no play. That was the agreement in my house, and uh, it worked really well. Growing up in L.A., it was challenging at times because it's a metropolis and it's, it's one of the largest cities in North America. Uh, the population at, at, as a whole in basketball was huge for us. You know, on the West Coast, we weren't as, we weren't as reputable because most of the writers were from back east. So I felt I had a, 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 big, a, big, uh, a big chore as a, as a whole with some of my peers. A lot of them looked up to me, including my teammates. And uh, a lot of adults gravitated to me, so that was difficult. By the time I was 15 years old, I was uh, probably one of the most sought-after players in the country. 
I was on Sports Illustrated. And uh, at that point, I knew I had arrived. Sports Illustrated was the biggest forum for us as athletes. And that was like the epitome, which pretty much is our pinnacle. So from there, it, it got really interesting. I had no personal life anymore. I was living in a fishbowl. My adolescence career took me a long ways. And, and the thing that separated me from a lot of people is I made sacrifices along the way. You know, my peers were doing things on the weekends, on Friday nights. I chose to go to the gym and get better. I'd swim, I'd run, we'd jump rope, lift weights, do a lot of stretching, and constantly, you know, push the bar to get better. And never, never dealing with complacency. And I think that helped me in my career, take me a lot further than a lot of my peers. I had a lot of success from a young age. I became the number one player in the country by the time I was 15 years old. And at that point, things really got interesting for me. Nike became huge. For me, they were sending stuff directly to my home. I had everybody at my kitchen table beside Phil Knight, who's the owner of the company, and had a personal relationship, developed a rapport. They were, they were sponsoring guys like Gary Payton, Michael Jordan, Charles Barkley, guys of that nature, and I had direct relationships with the people that they were dealing with. Pretty much had a sponsorship all the way through high school, and it was great because I'd have boxes of stuff probably this wide, this tall, coming to the house pretty much weekly. You know, I had a direct line to the main people, pretty much pick up the phone, you name it, I had it. So that was a great, great experience. The traveling as a whole, you know, f as a kid, I mean, I've been to every major city in North America by the time I was probably 16, 17 years old. So it helped me develop and evolve as a person, and I grew up really quickly. A little introduction about the AAU for all you're not familiar with the AAU, it's the Amateur Athletic Union. AAU is pretty much the springboard which catapults a lot of these top guys that you see in the NBA today into the profession where they can make a lot of money. Whether it's guys like James Harden playing with the Houston Rockets, whether it's Kevin Durant playing with the OKC Thunder, uh, Kobe Bryant dibbled and dabbled a little bit in the AAU circuit when he came from Italy to the U.S. and migrated to the Philadelphia area. Various different guys, Kevin Garnett, all these guys came out of the AAU circuit. So a lot of the best NBA players are coming out of this, this circuit in, as a whole. The problem with the AAU circuit today is it's money generated. It's driven. They look at kids as commodities. You know, it's a lot younger where they're recruiting kids. I'm talking five, six, seven years old. You know, this kid could be the next, this kid could be the next. I mean, it's, it's really disgusting when you think about it. And the importance is the household. The parents have to play their position and really raise their kids to be whole, holistic, well-rounded people and not just be so one-track mind, basketball, basketball, because the injury could end everything. And then you have to have education to fall back on. So that, that's what I teach our kids. The academic component combined with the athletics, you can go a lot further. It opens doors that academics by itself doesn't. And when you bring them both together, it's a lethal weapon. Some examples of uh, hardships in the AAU circuit. The problem with the, with the game in the AAU is everything is pretty much catered to you, whether it's the travel accommodations, you know, on and off planes, into vans, into the hotels, five-star hotels and better. It's a, really, it's a really a good life for a lot of people, but you get pampered, so if you don't stay focused and stay driven, you can become complacent, and then that's what, what can be a detriment long-term. Uh, a lot of people in the AAU circuit are just looking for the opportunity with the kids. There's sponsors involved, Adidas, Nike, Under Armour. It's millions of dollars we're talking about. These AAU coaches are making six figures for, for pretty much four to six months of coaching. It's a lot of money when you think about it, and the stakes are high. The pressure's there. I dealt with all of it growing up, but I, I was an entertainer. I loved it. I knew that I had a gift, and I worked extremely hard at it, and I had fun. It was really a blessing for me, and for me now, doing what I'm doing as a mentor. Currently, I own my own basketball academy, SCBA. We've been doing it for about 10 years. I just put out an AAU team, Man Child Elite. We're really excited about that. Um, we just won our first tournament last weekend. And we're actually playing as we speak. Uh, the game should be finishing up. I believe uh, we're going to win this one by about 30. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, we have a documentary that's going to be released uh, through the LA Film Festival. It will show June 2nd at 9 p.m. Anybody that's interested, you can go to the LA Film Festival site, scroll down and click buy. You're more than welcome. We'd love for you to come out. It'll be at Arc Light Theaters in uh, Culver City. And we're really look looking forward to that. And we're really excited. As far as um, my career as a whole, some things happened along the way that uh, I really can't get into the details of it because some of the stuff has to be saved for the, for the documentary itself. But 
Long story short, I was one of the best players to ever play and come out of Los Angeles in probably the last 25 years and didn't get the nod in the NBA long term like a person like Kobe Bryant. I was blessed to be able to play against Kobe in high school. Uh, he was my best one-on-one -on -one matchup. And on that day, I was better than him, and my team won. And that's something I hold dear. You know, I don't hang it over his head. I just remind myself, this is the best player in the game today that people can remember. When we played against each other, I was better. And I know I can take that same drive into business and what I'm doing today, and that's what I choose to do. Rather than harp on the past, look towards the future and work every day to be better, each second. And if anything I could tell people to learn from my story is my drive. No matter what you're faced with, you keep going. That's the reality. Everybody has hardships and pitfalls. But what do you do when you have adversity? Things get tough. Do you quit or you find ways to, to get it done, to produce? That's what life is about, interacting with people from all walks of life, just like in this room. Everybody comes from different demographics, but we all have talents. It's recognizing what those are and maximizing it. A person who experienced in the structure in the AAU circuit, what, what separates me from all the other kids is I had a gift early on, and I was way better than everybody else, and I worked, and I never changed as a person. And I think that's allowed me opportunities today where I can network with people and have an opportunity to speak here at TEDx, which is a great opportunity. I have spoke all over the country, you know, ACC. I've spoken to MBPA, Top 100 for the NBA. Yeah, I've, I've been to the headquarters. There's a lot of things that are developing right now, but this form right here is a true blessing for me because TEDx goes beyond sports. You know, this is business, network. People all over the world follow this. You know, so for me, I know I'm on the right track, and I just want to keep building from here. I take the same drive in business as I did in basketball. You know, the game of basketball teaches us a lot about life, and at the end of the day, we can go a lot further when we build and come together rather than trying to be an individual. Me personally, the game of basketball where it, where it is today with the AAU, I think it needs a lot of work. The problem is the people behind the scenes and the adults that are administering these kids and mentoring them, they're giving them the wrong advice. A lot of them are selling them down, down a river, you know, and, and there's no water there. What happens when they don't make it? Somebody has to be there to coddle them, to nurture them, to get them back on their feet because it can be demoralizing. So what I'm doing today is, is, a, is a small percentage of the population, really helping kids long-term develop camaraderie, teamwork, sacrifice, and showing them what true work is along with integrity combined with academic component and your athletics and mentor them along, and they'll be su successful in life, not just in basketball. And that's more important in the long run. I want to thank everybody for this opportunity, TEDx, UCSD especially, and I want to tell everybody, believe in yourself when no one else does, and you can do whatever you put your mind to. Thank you.